Hello everyone, and welcome to another video on deep learning, part of the deep learning series. This one's gonna be on convolutional neural networks. And uh, so just before I start and dive into this, if you're not familiar with deep learning or artificial neural networks or some of the concepts surrounding those, I suggest you check out my first uh, video where I walk through that and uh, also walk through concepts like gradient descent and backpropagation, because those are gonna be fundamental to understanding uh, the concepts of a convolutional neural network, which has a little bit more complexity than a traditional artificial neural network. With that disclaimer uh, being said, uh, let's dive in. So what is a convolutional neural network? A CNN is basically, I'm gonna give you a formal definition real quick and walk through and talk through it, uh, but it's basically a learn deep learning algorithm which can take in an input image, assign importance using learnable weights and biases to various features and objects in the image, and then differentiate one image from another. So um, basically in more English terms, uh, what that's saying is, you know, this is an algorithm which can recognize important characteristics that make up an image and be able to use it to classify that image, right? Um, and so let's talk about, okay, you might have said, you might be saying right now, well, in the previous video to artificial ANNs, uh, our a artificial neural networks, we were just discussing how we were classifying uh, handwritten digits, images of handwritten digits. And so that worked very, very well. And so you're wondering, you know, why are we introducing something new to classify images? Well, it turns out that the images we were classifying were black and white, so they're one dimensional. Then they were also very small, 28 by 28. And uh, it turns out that as we scale this, ANNs turn out to be extremely, uh, you know, they actually don't work uh, as you scale and use larger images or color images. And um, so they become a lot more computationally unmanageable. And, you know, if you can just imagine it, each image input has to be connected to every network neuron in the network. And so we get this problem of, you know, as we scale our images and, you know, nowadays we're not working with images that are hundred pixels by hundred pixels. We're working with color images that have upwards of, you know, a thousand or 4,000 if you're in 4k, you know, 4,000 times 4,000 times three. And so if you're feeding that in, it has to uh, go through every neuron in the network. Uh, you can see how that the computational load becomes exponentially uh, increases exponentially. Um, so we need a solution that's more computationally manageable that will can run in a decent amount of time on, your, on a normal machine. The second thing that uh, reason that we use CNNs instead of ANNs is that it turns out ANNs are not they are extremely sensitive to location in an image and they learn basically not a straight feature but they learn a pattern or a shape in that in a certain part of the image. And so unfortunately, if we move, let's say we have a picture of a cat, if we move it from the top left to the top right, or maybe dilate it or sh uh, shrink it, or spin it around, rotate it a little bit, uh, ANNs will not be able to recognize the same image of a cat if it's, uh, you know, trans if it's transformed like that. Whereas CNNs are a much more robust solution that can actually, are not sensitive to location and image, and they're training on a sp to learn to recognize specific features so that you can have a shrunken cat, a rotated cat, a dilated cat, uh, but it's still going to recognize it as a cat. And that brings me to the third point, that it can process, CNNs can process a lot more complex media uh, and color images with less risk of overfitting, uh, you know, and because it's not just learning on a specific image in a specific location, in a specific uh, angle, uh, you know, it, the risk of overfitting, it, it can generalize to a lot more in images. And so you're you're much less likely to overfit your model. Um, so that you just keep those three points in mind as we, you know, that's kind of why we wanted to, we need a better model and the CNNs present us much better model for image processing. So let's walk through the uh, typical structure, uh, the structure of a typical CNN. Um, basically I attached an image here. This is kind of a typical structure. Uh, it doesn't have to look exactly like this, but most are going to have all these steps. So we feed in our image, uh, in this case, the input image to the left. Um, and I'm going to just kind of circle that. And we walk through, there's three different important steps to learn here. Uh, convolution, then we apply a step called re relu, and then we call a step, uh, apply a step called max pooling. And then we can sometimes repeat it uh, two or more times depending on uh, whether, you know, how we've built our model. But the three key steps here are convolution, relu, and max pooling. And then the last step here is we actually send that output of convolution, relu, and max pooling to a fully connected layer. Uh, it's basically just a regular traditional neural network. So this part hasn't changed. You already know how this part works. We're just gonna walk through this part and see how these three steps uh, really help us gain computational savings and also make this model more robust than a traditional artificial neural network. So 
What is convolution? Before we dive into the convolution step, we got to understand what it actually is. Uh, the mathematical definition is an operation of two functions which produces a third function that expresses how the shape of one is modified by the other. Um, in, in, in English, what this is saying is if you can imagine, let's say we're taking two waves, right? Uh, electrical wa output waves, and uh, you know they end up um, overlapping with each other. Uh, you know, convolution is a way of saying, okay, what does the resultant wave look like when we take those two waves and put them on top of each other? Um, and mathematically it turns out, so here's the definition for when we have continuous functions, uh, f of x and g of x, we just take this change of variables and uh, now anywhere we have uh, x in the function of f, we just replace with tau and then and the g in g, which uh, uh, anywhere we have x, we replace with x minus tau. And in convolution, f here is known as the, the kernel and in uh, our CNN, we're going to call it the filter and g is known as the function that is going to be uh, undergoing the convolution. So you're, you're convolving that kernel on top of the function and you're going to integrate from zero to X, uh, and take the, your derivative with respect to tau here. So this is the, you know, definition for two convolving two continuous functions. And if you want to see, uh, you know, learn more about convolution and exactly, you know, I can walk through an example, I'm making a separate video on that to save time here, but you can see how exactly uh, the math that we walk through to actually convolve two functions. And we're also going to walk through how to convolve two matrices because uh, in CNNs we work with matrices. So the equation is actually just adapted from this top equation for continuous functions. Instead of integral, we have a summation and we're summing over um, the outputs here in uh, both the rows and the columns. We're taking H, which is that filter uh, kernel, and then we're t uh, convolving it on to F, which is the uh, function. And so this is basically the same thing as this. Don't be um, intimidated by the summation terms or all the little sub subscripts. We will, it will all become very clear when you see how this operation works. It's very simple. Um, so um, actually, right before I look, uh, I'll just give you kind of the bottom line. When you think about convolution, all you're doing is taking an element-wise product from one matrix to the other and then summing all of those products, those element-wise products that you did. Um, and that's it. So if you convolve two four by four matrix matrices, you're going to get a one uh, one by one matrix as an output. You're just going to get one number, which is the sum of all those element wise products. Um, so step one, the convolution step. Now let's see how it actually applies in a CNN. Um, we take our in input image. I'm using a really badly drawn, a poorly drawn line here of twenty eight by twenty eight, and then we're going to apply. It's going to be assuming where it's in color, and we are going to apply three filters. Uh, the filters here, also known as the kernels. Uh, in this case, I chose a red filter, green filter, blue filter. Uh, you can have a lot of different filters, and this is where it's kind of a hyperparameter hyper parameter you can adjust as you, uh, you know, modify your model um, is the number of filters you use to learn different features. Each filter is going to be kind of uh, learning a specific feature uh, in the data set uh, or in the image, right? So um, in this case, I'm going to apply three. And note that each of the features, the, what we're calling filters here, they're basically just a set of weights. Uh, that we're going to use for convolution. And these weights, just like in the regular artificial neural network, are going to be adjusted as we backpropagate and train our model uh, to learn on the data. So we convolve the uh, filters with the input image and get the resultant what we call feature map in CNNs. Uh, and so that feature map I'm going to label as G here. I uh, and, uh, also kind of attached a, a GIF of uh, con matrix convolution here, what's going on is we have a three by three filter and we are taking convolving with three by three segments of the image input image and we are moving over unfortunately the gif is frozen right now but we're moving over by one and uh we move over by one because that's what we call it's actually an input we can decide it's an arbitrary input called the stride length uh we can move over by two three four oh there it goes now see how it's moving over by one or uh, down by one that is um, uh, our stride length. And so we convolve each, each of those uh, yellow uh, three by three matrices is a one convolution step. And we end up uh, with nine different convolutions here in our uh, feature map, in our results of feature map, which we're calling G. So uh, just another thing to uh, think about right here, a uh, quick shorthand to get the dimension of the resulting feature map, given your input image and your filters, uh, it's a quick formula you can apply. Take your input dim uh, dimensions of your input image, subtract it from the dimensions of your filters, 
uh, if you if your filter and then uh, divide by the step the stride length and take the floor of that and by floor I just mean round down so round down and then add one very simple um, that'll give you the output dimensions of your feature map um, step 1.2 and I'm saying 1.2 not 2 because it's typically uh, uh, written as a part of the first step it's applying relu if you look at the initial image it says convolution plus relu that's how you're gonna see it written a lot of times um, so Going down to step 1.2, it's an extension of the convolution step. After the convolution step, we're going to end up with a lot of negative values, and ReLU is a way of applying nonlinearity. And if you don't know why we apply nonlinearity in neural networks, uh, I advise you to go watch my intro to deep learning. But basically, uh, all neural networks rely on these nonlinear activation functions to be able to train and learn on nonlinear data. If, uh, as of now, you know, the, the convolution step is a linear operation, and so we need to introduce some nonlinearity so that when we go and start learning and modifying, uh, we will be able to learn in general to nonlinear models, which is the whole point of CNNs and neural networks in general. Uh, so all really is going to do is turn all the negative values to zero. It's a very simple operation. Um, so now we get our resultant feature map with all values greater than or equal to zero. Okay, that brings us to the next step. So after the convolution step, we have identified some important features, but we're still missing a very key part of this uh, model before we can send it to our fully connected layer, and that is what we call downsampling. And unfortunately, we haven't solved, if you think about what we need downsampling, all that downsampling means is shrinking the size of the sample. And so if you think about after convolution, we have this 28 by 28 image up here, and we are tricking it down to 24 by 24, but then we had three filters, so now we're actually scaling up into three dimensions. So we've actually uh, increased it, increased the amount of computation we have to do, um, which is, you know, not, it's not necessarily what we're, we're, we're trying to shrink it as much as possible. The whole point of CNNs is to reduce the computational overhead of the, of the, of the computer. And so that's the point, that's the function of this downsampling step, is we're going to reduce the computational overload and shrink it down further. So before, in order to do that, we use, utilize a um, technique called pooling. And pooling comes in many different forms, but you know, there's max pooling, sum pooling, and average pooling, which the, the latter two are not as popular as uh, max pooling, and we're gonna use max pooling today. But max pooling, all it does is slides a window across the feature map, similar to what we did in convolution, and then takes the max value of each window and so it's basically the exact same thing as convolution, except except the convolution operation, you are just taking the maximum value of that window. So just to sh uh, show you a quick example of what max pooling means, in this four by four matrix, we are going to slide this two by two window, and in each two by two window, we're gonna take the maximum of those values, of those four values. And so if you see, okay, the first one's eight, so we're gonna, t we're gonna put eight over here. And you know the next one here is going to be six, so we're gonna have six, and so on. And uh, so, you know, this is going to be this four by four with a two by two window is going to result in a two by two output. And you can actually apply the same function to determine the out resultant output of max pooling, um, you know, given your input di dimensions and your window dimensions uh, using the same equation we did for the uh, convolution step, this equation right here, just to keep in mind. So now, okay, we just to re-step and re um, kind of uh, take a step back and see where we are now. We've applied convolution to our input image, uh, and we've also applied a max pooling step, and as well as ReLU. Um, and so now we've shrunken our image from 28 by 28 to 5 by 5 by 3. That is substantially better. And that's why generally, also, you know, if you have big images or different things going on, you won't just do one of these steps. You're going to apply another step or multiple three, four, five steps of convolution, ReLU, and then max pooling to really shrink that image down and, and focus on just the max feature, uh, the, the most important features. Uh, one other thing I'll call out real quick, going back up to max pooling, is it, it, while it shrinks the image, it also serves as a purpose. Max pooling, you know, it, it tends, if you see these numbers, the higher the number, the more uh, all of that signaling is, okay, it found the feature there, right? The lower the number, the lower uh, probability that there's a, an important feature that, that that filter was looking for. So all max pooling does is really just distill all the all the noise and say, okay, what are the most important things here? Where where are the most important features? Let's just take that and you know let's let's use that. So um, that that it shrinks down all this noise. Now we have a lot less numbers going on, and we really just simplified it to our important features, which is uh, kind of a good way of distilling the important, taking the important stuff out and to, uh, filtering out all the noise, uh, so that we can reduce our computational overhead. Okay, so 
We've walked through the first two steps, convolution, relu, and max pooling. Now it's time for step three. This is where we repeat, if necessary, repeat steps one and two and have you know multiple convolution and max pooling layers. And then we walk through step four. So step four is now we're ready to, we've shrunk the images enough, we've gotten the features, now we're gonna send it to the fully connected layer and all the fully connected layers is basically just a regular old artificial neural network. So we're gonna take the resultant vectors and flatten them. And by flatten, I just mean make into an N by one array and, and rows in one column that can be fed into a traditional ANN. So for this five by five by three output that we got, we're gonna have a 75 by one input vector. And notice that I, uh, you know, multiplying all these three numbers because we have each, each, uh, each uh, feature map, but then we've taken, you know, multiple feature maps. So we're, we're just gonna stack those on top of each other. So it's gonna be one big row. So that's why it's crucially important to reduce the size as much as possible. Uh, when before you feed it in here because once you feed it in here, it's going you know the computational overhead uh, does not decrease and it actually gets it gets a little bit worse. So uh, make sure that we utilize these convolution and max pooling steps to really shrink down the the image into the important pieces of information. Um, right before I dive into into it, uh, I want to call out an important thing here that uh, in CNNs we traditionally, out use the softmax function at the end with the output neurons to get a resultant probability. Uh, and that's just a kind of a convention and a, pro, a standard practice in CNNs. You're going to use the softmax function. And if you're not familiar with the softmax function, I recommend uh, doing a quick Google. But basically all it does is uh, takes outputs and converts them into a probability. And by probability, I mean they just converts those values into uh, values that sum to one. Um, so that's what we define as a probability. So step four, after we sent it to our fully connected layer, now we're going to step five, where we, okay, we've fed all our information through the network uh, and fed it forward, gotten a prediction, we've compared it to what we thought it was going to be, our, de our desired value, and gotten an error, right? And so now we have to use that error to uh, tweak our model to minimize the error, right? It becomes an optimization problem. And this is where we go straight from, take a page out of the ANN book, and backpropagate the error to converge. Uh, backpropagation CNNs is going to be pretty much exactly the same as ANNs up until the convolution and max pooling step. And uh, there, it just gets a little bit different, uh, not too much, not too complicated, or nothing, nothing new. Except instead of multiplication, we're going to use another convolution because we did a convolution step to get forward, uh, and max pooling. We did a max pooling step to get forward. We're going to need to do uh, a convolution step to get backwards in the same way. So I'm not gonna go through that here, but just keep that in mind at a high level. I will talk about backpropagation CNNs and walk through the math exactly uh, in a different video just for brevity. Um, so just know that you know the, the only difference between backpropagation in an ANN and a CNN is really that convolution step between uh, to get to go backwards instead of multiplication. Um, so a few other things I wanna to touch on before we finish. Uh, why are CNNs important? that they, they're not just good for image processing, they are good for a lot of other problems. And if you can, the only key here is that if you can pro formulate your problem as an image, CNNs can solve it. And so if you think about, okay, just to find a creative way to structure your problem as an image, you could have uh, utilize a CNN to solve that problem. Uh, a good example of this is an audio, you know, an audio file you could have, and I could just draw this out real quick. In an audio file, you could have um, something like, um, let's see, it just has to be put into a matrix, right? You have this audio file of all these uh, noises and you can say, okay, for your rows, you can have uh, different frequencies, right? Whatever the different frequencies are to make up that audio file. And then you can have in your columns each time step, time step, time one, time two, you know, time three, you can discretize it like that, time four. And uh, you can basically just structure this problem as a, as a matrix, right? and uh, use CNNs to solve this problem, to recognize audio files and uh, to recognize sounds, uh, audio recognition in CNNs. Oh, that is horrible. In CNNs. So just wanted to throw that out there just to kind of get you thinking in, in terms of the applications of CNNs. But uh, that's it for today. You now know how to build a convolutional neural, neural network and the basics of how it works and how to get to a solution. So uh, thank you very much for listening today and uh, look forward to giving you more videos and